So welcome everybody to the Brain Tank, the Applied Improvisation Network Think Tank for the highly intelligent and very dedicated people who are here today and those that would like to watch it afterwards. This is episode two and this one is about where does applied improvisation belong? So I'm posing that question wondering where it belongs if you're a university, if you're a business school, maybe if you're a publisher. So is improvisation, when it's applied, part of organisational studies, part of music or theatre, so it's an artistic pursuit, or is it maybe something to do with psychology or something different entirely? And of course, it might belong in more than one category, depending on what perspective you're taking at any given time. But where would we, as applied improvisation practitioners in the AIN network, like it to appear? assuming that we've got some say in that kind of decision or an influence in how it's perceived by the world. While the majority of AIN members find their way into the network via a theatrical route, I think that's still true, perhaps usually watching an improvisation show or attending a workshop led by a theatre director, it's possible that theatre is not the place for applied improvisers to remain. Conceptually, I've got nothing against theatre, um, I've been a theatre practitioner all of my life as well. But it's possible that positioning AI as primarily a theatrical phenomenon could be both misleading and reductive in ways that we'll explore. And we might want to position ourselves elsewhere. So I'm going to invite first thoughts on that from whatever perspective they like to come at it from the invited panellists. And then we'll go into maybe a couple of breakout rooms to let everybody say where they would think AI should be positioned. So we'll jump back and forth between panelists and between all the participants so everyone gets plenty of chance to talk and have their say. And the document that I've pointed you to is a Google Doc for all of the brain tank discussions. And we're on session two, so you'll find that after the page is devoted to session one. And thank you to Steve and to Lucas, who have both added some short essay pieces into that document, which you can dip into either now or later, depending on how gripped you are by the conversation itself. So um, I will invite first Lucas to respond to what has just been offered and tell us who you are and wh where you think applied improvisation belongs. And I'm going to ask you to make reference to your research areas diagram, because I find that fascinating. Yes, sir. Um, so I, I work at the University of Krems in Austria. And the research project you mentioned is on organizational improvisation. So we try to figure out what improvisation is and how you apply it to organizations. Now, if you apply improvisation, then I would ask first, like, what is improvisation? You know, like, before you apply it, you have to understand it. Uh, and that's more complex than um, one can think. Um, I mean, the easiest part or introduction is like improvisation, you know, it's come from, whoa, this is my son slamming the door. So it's unforeseen. This is improvisation. <laughs> um, so this is just seeing. Um, Pro visus, the foreseen and im means the unforeseen. So it's something about the unforeseen or dealing with the unforeseen. Um, and I guess this is the idea, like you do not know what will happen and then you act somehow. You react to a trigger or you act pro proactively like in a, a theatrical uh, performance. I think this is the main idea. And if you apply it, in it's such a general uh, idea you can apply it anywhere it's it's the same question like i would ask like okay planning where do you apply planning it's the applied planning network and we try to apply planning in education and leadership and creativity and so on so i think on a general level you can apply it anywhere um, but being more focused, I think we can learn a lot from, you know, improv theater and uh, especially because it's situations that are, you know, more or less typical in life. Um, and they, they developed some nice methods and skills and techniques uh, that you can apply it in a, in a non-theatrical context. So 
in, in, in short or in a nutshell, I would say it, like it's a general behavior that you can learn and you can apply it in various contexts, for example, in organizations, um, but also in, in very different domains. Um, and the question is how, but this is the next question. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a slightly different question, which is this sure. diagram, which as I understand it is where it gets mentioned where the, the term improvisation gets mentioned by various academics who are studying it. Yeah, so if you're uh, for, there, there are different scientific databases, for example, Web of Science, and there you can search for, for a, a topic, for example, I I improvisation or improvising or improvis asterisks. Uh, and then you can see like in which domains uh, do they use this word? Uh, and uh, what we saw is that there are many different areas, like in music and in arts, but also in engineering, in management, in IT, and so on. Because if you think of artificial intelligence, some parts try to, you know, um, simulate human behavior. Like, you know, if, if you talk to each other, we are improvising right now. Now, if they understand better how to improvise, then you can also teach. Um, a machine to improvise that it feels like you talk to a normal person. So they're interested in improvisation, but also in management because they have to deal with a lot of unforeseenness, so to say. Um, so you can look in scientific databases where and how often they use it. And what you see in the last about 25 years, that's, it's a really exponential curve. Um, yeah, exponential curve. Everyone knows now what an exponential curve is <laughs> from last year. Um, but <laughs> here it's about more and more people are interested or at least talk about improvisation. I think that's, that's interesting for various um, points of views. Yes. So in that di particular diagram, those that can't see it, there's about 1,500 citations in music, um, 700 in engineering, and only 233 in theatre. And of course, it, it's improvisation is talked about in everyday life as well. If you're watching television for a couple of days, you'll see improvisation mentioned in sports commentaries pretty regularly, which wouldn't be reflected in what's happening here. Thank you, Lucas. I think, sure. Steve, would you like to come in next? Because there's some mention there of organisations, and that might be the field where you're looking to put it. I ask you to unmute Steve so that we can all benefit from the wisdom. Very little wisdom, I'm afraid. Um, my background is in business and management, and um, I do most of my research around project management in, um, sorry, most of my research around improvisation in the project management domain, because I used to be a project manager. And, you know, I realized when I started reading about um, organizational improvisation in the mid to late 90s that, you know, project managers improvise all the time, just that they don't necessarily tell anybody they're doing it. Um, <clears throat> so there's a, a certain amount of surreptitious improvisation to try and claw back time and cost overruns and such like. Um, but one of the things about organizational improvisation, from my point of view anyway, and I come at it from the at the organization level rather than at the individual or small team level. I appreciate that for many for many members of AIN, you know, they they're facilitators and they're trainers and they work with small groups and, and with individuals about, you know, allowing yourself to improvise. I come at it from a different end because I really look at it from the organizational point of view and how do we get improvised work to be accepted by managers in organizations. Um, and that really uh, means that from my point of view, um, organizational improvisation or the increased use of organizational improvisation is more about shifting the culture of the organization to allow that to happen. So shifting away from um, process and procedures and logical, incremental, linear ways of doing things to a situation where 
if something is problematical and we need to fix it quickly, then allowing people to improvise and in the, the to use the um, the definition that Christine Mormon and Anne Minor came up with in the late in the late nineties to you know to to converge planning and execution. In other words, to basically decide what to do and do it pretty much simultaneously. Um, you you have to build a culture in organizations that allows people to do that and allows people to build their skill base in this area without being penalized if it doesn't work perfectly. Because one of the things about improvised work is that while you're learning, you don't, you don't always improvise, improvise effectively. Sometimes you improvise and it doesn't work, you know? And so there has to be um, an acceptance that, that, you know, learning from failure is important, is important as well as learning from success. The problem for managers, of course, is they're not really interested in learning from failure. They only want to learn from success. You know, fail, failure is something that, that is not acceptable. Um, and that's why sometimes, you know, in, improvisation is pushed underground, you know, is surreptitious because, you know, if you improvise and fail in an organization where that is not really accepted culturally, then the first thing someone is going to do is to blame you for stepping away from the plan. If I go back to my project management thing of, of having a plan and then executing it, you know, the first thing someone is going to say is, or the senior manager is going to say is, what were you doing? You know, why not stick to the plan? So there um, has to be an appreciation of and tolerance of risk. There has to be an appreciation and tolerance of risk. And, and if you're holding, just check with what you're saying, if you're holding a mirror up when you're studying an organisation to them, you're showing them that they do, in fact, improvise in the sense of bringing execution and planning together. So they're operating in the moment in the way that Lucas described yeah. and that it would behove them well to recognise it. To recognise it, it and to support it. it and to, yeah. you know, and to encourage it. In, in and to encourage it. Um, okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, when I did my PhD, which I just happened to have on the shelf here, you know, because I brought it home from the office the other day, because I didn't really want to leave it there when I left. Um, I did about 100 interviews with people in the project domain over half a dozen different financial services organizations, and every one of them admitted to improvising. <gasps> Once I'd explained to them what improvisation was, um, but the vast majority of them didn't necessarily approve of their team members improvising and didn't actually, you know, broadcast the fact that they were improvising themselves, but they saw it as a legitimate way of getting things done and indeed an essential way of getting things done. Um, but, you know, when I talk about improvisation in class, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get on to where improvisation fits within an academic curricula at some point over this session. But when I talk about them in, in class, you know, my, my approach to pro project management and to innovation, which are the, th the things that I teach, are behavioral. You know, I come from, a, I come from an organizational behavioral theory background. Um, so, you know, I, I talk about motivation and trust and commitment and all that sort of stuff, trust being particularly important. Um, but I also talk about risk. And one of the problems with improvising in projects is that theoretically, at least, somebody's holding a risk register, but you can't go, oh, I need to do something now. Let me go back to the risk register and pour through that and update it before I, you know, before I improvise. What you have to do when you're improvising in the domain where I research is you have to move forward and you have to try things, but with one eye on risk. So that if you start to get to a stage where things are starting to look unsteady, where things, you know, look as if you're reaching, oh, I don't know, call it a tipping point if you want, where it could all collapse into chaos. You have to be able to step back onto firm ground and say, okay, that's not going to work. What, what can I do instead? So there's risk is in the back of your mind all the time when you're doing thank, this. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Suzanne, where do you 
come from and where do you perceive improvisation living? Okay, I'm, yes, I'm Suzanne and I studied psychology and theatre and I'm, as all of you, probably most of you are doing trainings with applied improvisation, working for different universities and also different companies and institutions and having also written two books uh, about applied improvisation. And I'm uh, thinking about the university where Gunther is working. Uh, it's called the uh, University of Applied Arts and it's in Zurich. And I don't know if there are so many around, but I think it's, it would be the perfect fit because <laughs> applied arts, it's really for me what applied improvisation is about. And I actually got in touch with them, not with Gunther, but with somebody else at the university and asking them if they would be interested to put up a curriculum for training applied improvisers. And they were a bit interested, but not enough to actually do it. <laughs> so maybe I, I will come back to them <laughs> in another year. I don't know. But yeah, that for me would be really the perfect fit, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. And Ralph, Tell us something of your background and sideline activities <laughs> and then where you would position things. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm Ralph, I'm, I'm German. Um, I started working um, as an electrician actually, and then moved over to social work to a business administration study um, and ended up at the business school uh, doing basically most of my work in, in teaching on applied improv and on clown. Um, and um, if you asked me where to put it, I would bluntly refuse to answer um, and say it's improvisation as such is, is, a, is, is, is a practice that to me almost by definition is undermining the usual categorizations and uh, disciplinary uh, realms that we find in a university as much as in a business school. Um, and theoretically, I come from from organizational theory, but mainly influenced by second order cybernetics um, and by, by social systems theory, which is um, on, a, on a cognitive and theoretical level, almost um, the equivalence to an, to an improvisational practice. It's not easy to spot it or to, to put it into one of those domains. They're under, they have a very specific way of undermining and, and, and breaking typical patterns of, of disciplinary thinking and focused on going beyond that. And I think on a pragmatic, on a practical and level, improvisation is doing nothing else and it's actually nothing else than a mirror of second order cybernetics and certain system theories. Um, and thankfully we even have an author here in the room who has been conceptualizing and writing the, about this. I'm just showing this little book, um, Play with Chaos from Gunzo where um, the connection between systems theory and improvisation is basically laid out. Um, and given the fact that I, I'm at the business school where it's all about goals, about plans, about control, um, and about functionalizing creativity, um, the practice of, of improvisation is basically the opposite of that. It is breaking exactly that and is introducing a very, very different way of, of thinking and of working um, that only two people in, in or well, three in, in, in my perception so far have been conceptualized. One is uh, Nassim Taleb. The second one is again, Günther Lösel. And the third one are actually the ancient um, Indians who talk about the via negativa. You don't, or you're not told about what to do, you're told about what not to do. Um, and all the exercises and all the mindset and all the science behind actually, in my view, is, is a, a positive way of tr to train you what not to do, to remove all the stuff that comes in the way when you want to create an emergent process. Um, and because of that, imminent idea and imminent contradiction to, 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 to very specific um, westernized way of thinking, go, going back to Descartes and God knows who, um, it is 
basically contradicting with this perspective almost any kind of paradigm in modern science, be it engineering, be it programming, be it business, be it education. And I think because of that, it's so important not to spot it somewhere unless it's for professional or for marketing reasons. Um, and because of that, I feel it is, we would do the worst thing we could do if we would try to conceptualize and box it in since then we, we kind of take away the, the almost revolutionary intrinsic power the whole thing has. And there yes. has been waves, if you look into, into, into the history of science, you can you see waves where second order and constructivist and systems thinking comes up and where improvisational practices are certainly in the focus and where they're not, where they disappear. Hmm. And what, is, what appears interesting to me, just as I speak, is that the waves when, when second order theories are on the rise the practice of improvisation is not very very common not very well known and now as we have a, a, a kind of a, a run through the institutions of the university second order cybernetic theories are not as common and not as strong anymore as they have been so that might be a kind of a disbalance but i'm i think i'm deviating okay so maybe I, i'm not trying to position it in any kind of definitive way just knocking about how we perceive it and where it might go. And that it sometimes will need to be positioned like as a topic of research or on a bookshelf or in a library, not necessarily for any other reason. And that perhaps it, there's a slipperiness to it in that very different way of conceptualizing that you have that makes it difficult to, to place. I wonder if you could mention your theatrical performances and whether that has, or to what extent that's informed your way of thinking about the theory and conceptualization of improvisation. You're still talking to me? I'm still talking to you, Ralph, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was not sure what it was. Ralph uh, has, uh, has done a, an amazing <laughs> theatre piece. Well, together with a with a uh, with a clown teacher and a, and a director, I worked out um, and played a fifty minute solo uh, mask show and brought it to the to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Um, and the the interesting, so I mean, again, I'm I'm an electrician almost by birth. I'm an engineer by birth, um, and for several reasons, which is another thing to discuss, I turned over a scientist into an, into into an artist. Um, and the interesting thing, I think, again, what we're talking, discussing here was while developing the play between the director, Li Di Long, and myself, there was just um, uh, the way of practice on how she's developing shows. And that is, you go from the stage to the page, to the stage, and to the page. And we started fully improvised. Um, uh, she was provoking the mask when I was wearing it. Um, and she was provoking the mask in a way that something was triggered in wind to come out, which was completely emergent, which was absolutely unplanned. I had no idea what the heck was going on with me and what was breaking out of me. And when I was, so to say, exhausted and nothing else was coming out of me in that practice, and that seemed to say, okay, now sit down, take off the mask and write it. So as in a way that you can replay it as you just did. Um, and we did that over over basically two days. Um, and 90% of the text that I have been writing have become actually the literal text that I had to, to learn by heart and to rehearse and to, and to talk. Um, and I'm, I'm telling this since that to me would be a nice way of, of combining the two different strands of thinking and of operating of the planned scripted theater and the, the unscripted emergent work um, that I've been experiencing in that moment, it would be kind of cool to see how we kind of not merge, uh, but kind of put things together. There is certainly in business and education, in social work, in, in, in theater, in arts, wherever, um, a place and a part of instruction where you need a goal, where you need control, where you need to plan, and at the same point, uh, you need a kind of informal emergent um, way <clears throat> of handling things. Um, and it's about 
not putting one over the other over the other, but it's more about when do I have to follow which script. Okay. And Thank again, you, that, that to me, that to me is not it's not a question of business. That's I mean, I think that's that's a a dualism that is probably happening all over the place. Yes, we people I think recognize that. So I'm I'm going to change my plan now in the light of emergent circumstances. And instead of going into breakout groups, going to invite a few more people to comment and going to start with Gunter because he's been referenced a couple of times. So it'd be nice to hear what his response is to what's been heard so far. Uh, I'm, fla I'm flattered um, to, be, to have been quoted. Um, my response is um, I'm, I'm very much in accord with the, uh, with the thesis that uh, Systems theory is probably the point where um, improvisation can be located best, which is not a good location because uh, systems theory is kind of everywhere. <laughs> so it's not, it doesn't really uh, help us to, to say this. But I think it's, uh, it's very much about um, the interaction of an entity with its environment, uh, its improvisation. And um, as I'm moving, as I'm growing older uh, and more experienced as an improviser, I think it's not uh, it's not only the interaction of the entity and, and the environment in the here and now, but it's also very much about uh, expectations. It's about predictions, and of course trust. Uh, so this kind of is more in my focus of attention at the moment. Um, what kind of environmental approaches? Could we have so so this kind of this moves towards an environmental approach, in, in my view, um, and what kind of expectations um, do we have, and are we proceeding in a way that we are trying to build environments that are predictable as much as possible, because we are not trained in uh, improvisation. So I think if we train improvisation, we might uh, be able to uh, not create environments that are predictable. <laughs> I don't know if you can follow me, but uh, I think well, we're, kind of, we're kind of in a need to, to, uh, to make our environments as predictable because we're not able to improvise. Yeah, that's It would be really interesting, and some organizations make the effort, some societies maybe make the effort to create the conditions in which improvisation can flourish. So safe container, encouraging people in certain ways, making resources available and, and many other things that you can do to encourage improvisation. I mean, we do them in our workshops. So if you were to generalize from that, you could extend that to creating conditions otherwise. But I think it's a very interesting view of the world that it's largely designed these days to create predictability and conformity. We recognize that in social media. Um, I like the idea of freedom within structure as well, that even when you have structures, there's always scope for how that structure is played with for each game iteration or round within whatever sphere we're working in. I think um, so just wa wave I'm your sorry. hand if you'd like to come in. Steve, no. let's, let's let the people who've not okay. yet spoken have one, one go each at least, and then we'll come back to, to the panelists. Uh, Ted, you look like you waved first and then maybe oh. Robert. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I've been just sort of taking some notes here and I'd start off by saying I would put improvisation in the field of psychology as a foundation. Um, the thoughts I had was that Anne and Mary's initial definition of planning and execution coming together, um, I think is very powerful, but it's a result. It's, a, it's an activity that humans do and potentially other um, animals do it as well. So I go back to fundamental psychology and I am not a psychologist at all, but I look at the field of animal behavior and I say all animals from the tiniest one-celled organisms up to human beings, we are all just reacting or responding to stimuli. In very small animals, it's called tropisms. You get into concepts such as intuition or automatic or planned responses, where we're all reacting to the environment in some fashion, in some way, as animals. And on a joke, on a side note or side joke, I think of one of Murphy's laws, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which is under the most rigorous conditions of temperature, pressure, and humidity, the organism will do as it damn well pleases. 
meaning animals react in all different ways in all different conditions. Uh, you can put an argument in there about efficiency versus effective response, but I think that's more tangential. But we also get into psychological issues such as innate responses or learned responses or instinctive responses. And not being a psychologist, I couldn't properly define what all of those are. But we also get to, at a certain level of animal response, some animals are capable of learning. They're capable of being trained. They're capable of doing experiments and learning from what the response is. And I think this all comes from the effort we have as animals to wanna to control a very ambiguous and a very unclear environment because the environment out there is ambiguous. The environment out there is constantly changing and to survive, we have to be able to respond. So kind of because of all of that, I think improvisation is an animalistic response to changings in environments. And this is all why I'm making the argument that I think fundamentally it goes into the psychological field because when you have responses, you can have productive responses, you can have neutral responses, you can have a negative response. Uh, and animals learn how to deal with their environment or with other animals by experimenting and there can be both productive and non-productive responses. So I'm kind of taking a psychological approach. I think business is an outgrowth, it was an application of that psychological reaction. I think theater is more of a representation of human behavior, but it's more designed to entertain, to enlighten, to amuse, to provoke. It's not actually where improvisation at its academic core comes from. So hopefully I've made a bit of a compelling argument, but I would put it in psychology. Thanks, Ted. Uh, so Robert, Alex, Josh, Ada, Alex. Um, a couple of you know <clears throat> some of my background. I've, I've been at improvisation for 40 years. Um, I came to it through improvisational dance and microtonal improvisational music. Uh, I didn't know about improvisational comedy at all at that time. I was introduced to it and just blown away by the learning effect. I saw an improv troupe play. I laughed myself silly. I came back two weeks later and I had never experience that kind of development of individuals and ensemble in anything that I had ever done. I'd been a bit of a teacher ever since I was a child, uh, 13 years teaching at Georgia State in the communication department. Um, so going back to, to my basic on, on where this exists, my fundamental belief, see, I, I trace improvisation. The first written work we have about the use of improvisation comes from the Attilene papers of the Etruscans. And improvisation has grown and developed through the Commedia dell'arte, and it, it, it uh, moved into theater, then it came, disappeared for a while, kind of came back in North America, actually by a psychologist, ultimately a psychiatrist, um, who did the first improv shows in New York City in 1925. He was studying spontaneity. I can never remember his name. If it comes up in a moment, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it. But he's the man who, deve who actually developed uh, drama therapy. And it got on the stage with- Moreno. Uh, Jacob Moreno. Moreno, right, right, uh, right, Jacob Moreno. Uh, he got on stage with uh, uh, newspaper headlines and his people he was playing with, and they would read the headlines and they would do little scenes. Um, then Neva Boyd carried, I think, the very first real applied improvisation out into the world and through Hull House. She worked with veterans across the country in America uh, in the 20s and 30s. Uh, then in 1955, theater began to develop, and that came also from a lot of philosophy and the like. And then, of course, in the last 20 years, the last 10 years, improvisation has exploded into the world. And my bottom belief about improvisation is that the the, the Art itself, I call it an art and science because it is both clearly, is, I believe, the next iteration of the evolution of human consciousness and collaboration, something necessary for us to survive on this planet. From there, I look, I, I, I look at it academically, and my first set in academia is that when you're talking at academics, you're talking a class in a, in a school or maybe a set of classes at a school, and then ultimately maybe a degree in that school. Well, there, there's no way to talk about uh, uh, improvisation as psychology, as business, as management, as any of these things in, in a single class, other than at the basic, basic introduction. 
at all to that. And yet we have seen uh, uh, it, it, all the way out, the expressions of it further. Ada has worked in, in improvisation in the medical field. Um, she's the one person I know here who has done that. Paul has worked in improvisation in every kind of field that there is. And my bottom line belief, and it's one of the funny things I see when I see improvisers around the world now, they'll say, oh, I've got this group I'm going to be working with. What, what are some good games to use to, uh, to accomplish this? I've got, I'm using, you know, doing uh, 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 scientists. What do I do? What games? Well, I believe that the truth of improvisation is, is that every improvisational form can be used in every situation to affect anywhere at all, and it all goes down to the baseline, the first thing of which, and this goes to who was talking about, oh, the, the human condition, learning to be in the current moment, Ralph <clears throat> went in that direction, learning to understand that the current moment is all there is that we actually have to deal with. We can think about the past, we can learn from the past, we can express the past, we cannot go to the past. We can only bring that stuff into our current moment. And in the future, it's all imagination. All the stuff in business, it's about predictability. X style management is if you do it this way and you do it my way, you will get this result. One, two, three, four. Well, you, you cannot predict the future. It doesn't exist. It's imaginary. So that being in the current moment, then we start to get to the places of safety that Paul has talked about. We get to the places of balancing all these things. So academically, to, to place it, it really depends on what's going to be in the material. If it's a single class, you can put it in any field whatsoever as an introduction to improvisation and then qualify it. All of my work in businesses, the business is first thing, what am I going to get from this? But what are we going to do with this? How's it going to work? What's going to happen? I say, well, what, what do you need? Well, we need X, Y, Z. Oh, well, sure. Improvisation works for X, Y, Z. As, as Steve was talking about the, the difference to marketing. But it also is that place. And with a group like this and the development of improvisation through the pandemic and through the Zoom work, this idea is being carried. I've watched it grow and grow. When I came to Atlanta, there was a, no improvisation here at all in 1983. And I started the first workshops, the first show, had the first theater, wrote a book about it. And I'm passionate about what it is. Because when you get people working in improvisation, engineers, I'll add a, a working with, with businesses, Alan Alda's work with, with the medical field, medical improvisation. Oh my goodness. And you can do an entire semester, you can do an entire curriculum, you can do an entire degree. I had one of my students at Georgia Tech take his PhD doing applied improvisation in robotics. And he got his PhD in that. And that's happening more and more and more. So as to where to place it, I believe the answer comes from the improv itself. Who is your audience? And what do they need to hear? that will open them up in a field of safety. And that thing, every mammal learns through play. Other animals do the same thing. Who is it? Uh, I think that Ted was talking about that. Uh, it's the whole organizational development of consciousness and humanity is what we're dealing with. And when we're dealing at the level of the people who are here, what an extraordinary, uh, folks, I have, I've got a bachelor's degree. And I taught at Georgia State. That's my academic background. I've been a rebel my whole life. I've lived in communes. Uh, I, I've been a Navy officer. I've done all these various kinds of things. And I came to improv. And the level of academia that is here on this screen in front of me did not exist at the beginning of my experience of improvisation. One or two people. Somebody might be a doctor who had some time. Somebody might be a, a teacher who had some time. You folks, I love it. The brain trust, Paul, the whole idea. <laughs> Thanks, look right. who is thinking about improvisation and oh, look yes. at it spreading around the world you've you've set I, a very high aspiration for it levels of next levels of human consciousness which is wonderful and there are people here talking about it but it still strikes me there's a very small number of people here and that one of the risks of saying it's everywhere is it ends up being nowhere if you well, compare I, it to I, say um, positive psychology. There'd be well, exactly. hundreds, if not thousands of people doing their PhDs in that. 
Well, that's there's only a handful good. doing right. them in applied improvisation. I'm well, going to move on point. to Alex, sure. um, but I'm going to introduce him with a response to something that Robert said. So I know that Alex lives in East Anglia, and you say you can't visit the past, Robert, but you said, people have said, if you want to know what Norwich was like in 1970, go there now. <laughs> <laughs> That's cruel. They used to say the same about Plymouth when I lived there. I'm closer to Ipswich, and given the rivalry oh, between the fair two enough. cities, I won't comment. Um, so for me, for me, I think, um, well, I mean, fascinating conversation. So many different kind of ways of looking at this. Clearly, context matters as ever. Uh, improvisation seems to be quite chameleon-like, depending on the the context. There's um, probably a couple of things that. So I don't know how to place it, but there's one thing I'd love to draw out from uh, Robert's book, which is a, a, a sort of a, a brief description of improvisation that has stuck with me, which is that it is a tool making tool, uh, like a meta tool. And I think that's a, a profound part of what improvisation can do. Um, in classes where I've taught, I've seen students kind of come to discover the thing they needed to. So it might have been, for example, around recognizing status behaviors um, and then getting the chance to experiment with those, uh, be more adaptable in what they do. And I think I've seen that as a, uh, I, yeah, I think that's an extraordinary property of improvisation. I don't know if that kind of puts it anywhere in particular, but I, I wanted to just note that. And the other thing that uh, I'm, I think there's, if there's the strongest connection I see, and it's just because of my uh, reading and understanding, is probably through psychology, um, and particularly through uh, the connection to flow. The conditions uh, Csikszentmihalyi identified as flow um, are so close, uh, in fact, maybe even the same as those I recognise through improvisation. Um, uh, things like having a, a clear goal or intention, in the moment, you know, what are you going to do? Not a goal necessarily for an outcome, but a goal in relation to the process, perhaps. Um, it tests your skill level to rise to the challenge. So you're, you're matching or balancing that. You get uh, instant feedback. And along with that, uh, intense concentration comes with that. And it's that kind of those optimal experiences, certainly for me, when you, uh, you know, feel your best, perform your best, have an element of improvisation because they're the edge of the comfort zone. It's the learning, it's the stretch. So I think the connection to psychology is super strong, but I recognize it is uh, just another context that you could put improvisation into. And what, what you've described from flow may well be the experience of people that they get when they're doing something that's described also as improvisational, mm -hmm. that's so powerful and compelling that they want again. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Ada, you've got um, a perspective that you've put in the chat, but maybe you'd like to speak to it. Uh, I, I want to be brief, and usually I don't manage that. I, I will <laughs> still try it here. Um, my, my, uh, I came late to this international uh, applied improvisation group. Uh, I, I live and work in Romania, and uh, my perspective is a little bit from outside. I just got in and I wanted to share this. There are two ideas. First is that uh, one of the, the areas that I think it's very relevant that hasn't been mentioned is education. Education is perceived, I think wrongly as um, boring and modern education is fascinating. And basically all of us are involved in education. And I like to, to think of education as changing people, changing ourselves and changing others. And if you think of it like that, of course, psychology becomes the same with education, part of education, education is part of psychology and so on. And there are modern theories in education that are very much connected. The whole co-creation idea that comes from education is core to, to, to improvisation. And what I want to bring to this conversation as a recent uh, entry in this group is the mindset. What is fascinating for me is the same kind of games, the same kind of activities used in an improvisation environment with improvisers, with people who have the improvising mindset work wonderfully. You give them to someone else, you give them to someone who does them 
you know, because they, they, they've been told to give them to a teacher who doesn't understand the improved mindset, doesn't know how to make the others look good, doesn't know how to build and accept offers. And it's not only tedious, usually it's painful. <laughs> and uh, the uh, pandemic, which put everybody on Zoom and on other platforms and everybody using improv exercises has done us a major um, mm. good part, but also has uh, diminished most of the tools because a lot of people are now more afraid of being put in a place where they have to dance or play games with people they don't know and put, make themselves vulnerable without creating safe spaces, without everything that's part of being an improviser. And I don't know how to address that, but I see it and I'm, I know because I've talked to many people from this group, being inside improvisation, you don't see it as much as I do. Maybe. You, you feel like everybody is like you are because mm. you, you have been in this group for such a long time. Coming from outside, it's like, yes, now I understand. Now I, I can play these games and I know how to build toward them. I, I see people who, who don't know how to do it wrong because they are improvisers, but you cannot um, give uh, disregard this, this perspective, the fact that it can be applied mechanically in a way that completely uh, ruins the whole concept. Absolutely. Thank you, Ada. I've been to plenty of improvisation workshops that have been conspicuously lacking any safe space. So it's just, it's poor facilitation, poor teaching. So I like putting it into the field of education to that extent, that there's a how to teach well that's a part of it. I'm also resistant to putting it in psychology, at least psychology is individual psychology, because so much of what's going on with the improvisation that we're talking about is it requires more than one person, typically. It's about collaboration and co-creation. And I know that that can be allowed for within some ways of doing psychology, but there's a lot of psychology that doesn't look at that at all. It starts looking in the individual brain and presents some EEG findings as if that's somehow insightful. Um, Josh, you're, you're not spoken yet, so I'll give you a chance to, and then we'll see who wants to accept some offers. And we, we'll just have another 10 or so minutes because I know some people need to go on the hour. Uh, thanks. Uh, this has been very interesting for me. Uh, I am a psychologist. I'm a cognitive psychologist. Uh, and so naturally, I think uh, improv belongs uh, in cognitive psychology. But I've noticed that the people who study systems think it belongs in systems. And the people who study theater think it belongs in theater. And the people who study education think it belongs in education. And uh, so I don't put much stock in the fact that I think it belongs in cognitive psychology. Um, uh, but uh, also I've uh, taught in a business school uh, almost my entire career. So I'm uh, very uh, sort of down to earth oriented. And I have to say that some of the discussion about second order cybernetics and the Etruscans and the human condition uh, sort of went over my head. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but from my point of view, uh, the way I uh, relate to improv is as a, a tool, uh, as a, a tool if in education. I use it to, to teach concepts because it gets people involved in sort of understanding something. For example, I two of the topics that I teach the business people are systems theory and innovation. And doing improvisation as part of that really makes the concepts more concrete. But also I see it as a, a different way of thinking, a skill, a sort of a, a cognitive skill, a way of approaching the world. And so from my point of view, I, I don't think it does belong anywhere. It's a little bit like saying, uh, what department uh, should we talk about uh, writing and written communication? Well, of course that belongs in business school and it belongs in, in the education department. And, and you might have a department 
uh, in sort of over in the in the language department, uh, English department, if you're an English speaking, where you do that as a topic, but it, but uh, communication doesn't belong there. Uh, people who study systems theory, you know, the same thing is they say, where should systems theory go? Well, you see it uh, pretty much everywhere from family therapy to robotics to medicine to whatever. It's a it's a, a skill or a way of thinking. So uh, that's my the way I see uh, sort of uh, how improv uh, fits in, um, both as a tool and as a, a sort of mental discipline. Uh, and uh, so for me, it, 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 it doesn't get categorized. It's, uh, it's, a, cross, it's a very cross-disciplinary thing. I'm, I'm more in that camp as well. Thank you, Josh. I saw a lot of nods on that. Lucas, <laughs> who has brought it in as a topic within a business school with its own cause. Um, I was just wondering, like categorization, where it belongs to and so on. And um, I just like the word experience. I think experience, experiencing, experiencing, is this the word? Um, mm -hmm. Improvisation is what I was fascinated from the beginning on. I, I, I experience um, the emergence of something, you know, it comes up, something happens in the, in the very moment. This is what I'm really fascinated. And I think that other people might be also interested or fascinated about this experience. And sometimes I feel like, you know, strange if people, you know, even me <laughs> or also me um, categorize this experience because like, oh my God, don't take it away. It's so hard sometimes for me to, to read uh, scientific papers on improvisation because it's like, you know, it's like reading on, on, about sex. It's okay. And it's nice, but it's different than experiencing it. So perhaps we can sometimes also focus on, you know, um, live the improvisation and then it's nothing strange or nothing uh, you know um, different it's the normal thing I, I mean it's, it's even strange if you're not improvising so it's very strange yeah. sometimes to me if people say oh when do you improvise like come on what when not so, so just you know the experience level i think it's, it's so one thing that we can also focus on cl clearly we've all identified it as experientially noticed and as every day so it's not confined to any specialist field. And, and reading about anything and doing anything is all, always creates that difference. Not, that's not uh, special to improvisation, I don't think. Suzanne? Well, maybe we can start a new department. I know in Austria, they did a department for group dynamics and they just did a whole new department for, and you can only study group dynamics. So maybe that's the best way to do it. <laughs> I think there's a sense that I have that it's important enough and perhaps it's already been conceptualized enough for there to be a lot more people being introduced to it, aware of it, valuing it in the way that Steve talked about right at the beginning and others have, have reflected on and that we haven't quite done that yet. And that maybe as a collective of applied improvisers, we can do something towards that. Steve, you wanted to come back before. I think one of the problems with working in a university environment and particularly working in a business school environment is that if you want to put something new into a program, then you have to take something out because there's no room to put anything else. You know, our programs are full uh, and there's a movement towards trying to deliver degrees with less credits these days, which means you're always looking to take stuff out and you don't want to take out anything in important and everybody thinks their stuff is important. You know, so so, you know, you don't so the finance people don't want to lose any finance space and, the you know, the, you know, et cetera. Um, mm. So I've had to sort of crowbar the my improvisation teaching into classes that I'm already running. Um, so I teach an innovation class, I teach an entrepreneurship class, I teach a project management behaviors, you know, behaviors around project management class. And in each one of those classes, I've managed to create a week where I can talk about improvisation and how it works, fits, influences the way that, um, that 
you know, this particular subject is evolving in project management. It's about dealing with emerging requirements, you know, so yeah. let's, you have to try and crowbar this in because that does seem very unfortunate in that it's always it crowbarred in or it some does, sort of sideshow. We'd, we'd all like to devote more space and more time to improvising and to getting people, you know, practicing this or at least experiencing it. But you usually don't have a lot of time because there's so much other stuff. So also with three minutes to go, I'm going to invite one sentence contributions of final wise words. I know it's an ongoing conversation, so <clears throat> temporarily final. Josh. Yeah, I'd say that uh, it's better to have something like AIN, a society for promoting uh, use of improvisation, rather than trying to make it into a department or find it a home. Uh, I think it's better to have a, a cross-disciplinary society or association that promotes its use. I think that's more effective. Thank you, Josh. Um, Ada, you had a two word wisdom in the chat. Do you want to unmute and say that? I, I've put normalized improvisation and to add to what Josh said, this is a community of practice defined very clearly. It's a community, AIN, it's a perfect example of a community of practice and uh, it should continue to do that. Uh, and be, be a Thank you. Any other single sentence concluding words of wisdom? Ted. Take a stab. Improvisation is like the elephant. Depending upon where you touch it, it feels different. We'll ask the elephant about that. Robert. <laughs> You're muted. Encourage reading, especially of original material uh, in, in the field. Just encourage that wherever you can. And encourage everyone to write more as well. Yes. Particularly a group like this that already has writing instincts. Yes. Gunter. Um, yeah, it's it's practice based. I, I really like the word experience, and it's uh, it's for me it's something like uh, unlearning. It's not learning; it's unlearning. So, because we all had improvisational skills at the very beginning of our lives, so this kind of makes a difference to almost any other practice. Thank you. Did you have a, a sentence, Ralph? Um, one sentence would probably be um, keep the um, let's 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 keep the the informality and the emergence in it um, and the undermining power it has by not too much defining it and not too much boxing it somewhere. Mm. Well, I've always seen the Applied Improvisation Network as an improvisational organization with that looseness, flexibility, and degree of emergence. Sometimes a struggle. Such. <laughs> so thank you all so much for a very interesting conversation. Feel free to keep writing things in the shared Google Doc and look out for future brain tanks. Next month, we're having a break from the brain tank and having a book club instead, but then it will be back in two monthly doses on the first Tuesday of, is it the first Tuesday of the month or is it the second Tuesday? It's the second Tuesday, second Tuesday of the month. Clearly, if it's the 13th, it has to be. So see you then. Thank oh, you all very much. Uh, indeed. Picking up on the writing and the book stuff, um, Routledge are currently, um, you know, there's a deal um, for uh, Routledge doing a, a handbook on organisational improvisation, edited collection of pieces, um, Miguel Kuner and Anne Miner and Dusha Vera, a couple of other people are editing it. But um, there's a whole bunch of people contributing towards this, including Frank Barrett and people like that, and indeed myself. Um, I don't know how long it'll be before it comes out. I think the deadline- End of 2020. Yeah, I think the, the deadline for chapters is this September. So it's gonna be a bit after that, yeah. <laughs> so it's more than a year now, so? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. Yeah. Much appreciated, including you the young, young Lozel there. <laughs> See you all.